folder. Good morning, everyone. Can you hear me? Can you Good morning, everyone. We are... Good morning, everyone. We are about to kick start the program of the day, which is um, which is um, our antimicrobial web series, as planned and executed by a joint committee of um, PSN YPG. I'm glad that we are all here. You can see a few attendees. So I will still give some time for people to join up, maybe up to two minutes, three minutes from now, and uh, it starts the program program. But before we do that, we already have our panelists set. And then the slides and everything is intact. So we believe it's going to be a very wonderful, very wonderful and um, event and something and um, hello can can everyone hear me clearly Please just let me know. Aisha Akaba, can you hear me clearly? Can you respond in the chat? I'm love. Okay. So I'll have to repeat myself. Um, we are from the project committee, and then we co-plan this event with other committees, the Public Health Committee and the Education and Research Committee, together with um, the Media Committee who helped in the publicity. So we, all, we, had, we had a lot of inputs from others. So to make this possible. And um, this program is planned to run for for the year is going to be throughout the year.
it's going to run through the year and um, we look at having it every third week of the month we have considered it a web series on antimicrobial resistance so different different topics we have discussed and um, it's going to be interesting sessions all through we have factored in the speakers who are going to be speaking and they are all top-notch speakers and we will stand to benefit from them all through this event basically the antimicrobial resistance project is um, one of the key projects of the young pharmacist group key administrative projects this for this administration so we are looking at rolling out these projects in three phases first we are still making that plans on going on the traditional media platform which is the tvs and the radio stations and then secondly uh, we are utilizing the platform already doing web series for professionals pharmacists and other healthcare practitioners and then thirdly we are also going to draw in policymakers to see how we can reduce the menace of um, anti um, microbial resistance that being said i i think we can proceed to commencing the meeting proper thank you all for coming i believe this is going to be a wonderful time for you all um, my name is Basapu Saro. I am the coordinator of Projects and Development Committee. So I welcome you to take this ride with me and then enjoy what we have to offer. Our facilitator is top notch. I believe you, you, you will judge for yourself. So at this point, I would like to leave the floor for him to just come in because we don't have much time so we can have enough time for questions and answers and please if you have questions while the series is running you can send it through our chat box we will see it and we'll give it needed attention thank you very much and i hope to see you stay through the event and benefit a lot from it Farm Tilov, please, you have the floor. Okay, thank you very much, um, Usura. Um, it's a great pleasure to be here to talk um, on this um, global travel antimicrobial resistance. Uh, unfortunately, I can't share my screen. Please, can you enable me to share my screen? Mm, okay. Great. Hold on. You are in. Yeah, yeah. Okay, can you all see my screen? Yes, you can. Unfortunately, I can't see the I can't see the chat uh, box. So let me, let me turn on my video. Okay, great. Let me share my screen now. Mm. 
Okay. Good morning, all, once again. Uh, can you hear me clearly? Hello, guys. Can you hear me? Yes, sir, we can hear you. Carry on, sir. Okay, okay, thank you. Uh, so it's uh, it's a great pleasure to be here in our midst, and um, uh, it's it always gives me pleasure to talk about antimicrobial resistance. Been in this space for for about four years now, since 2017, and um, yeah. So I am Love I'm a pharmacist. Um, I'm currently the outgoing project supervisor with Disability Solutions. Uh, the healthcare is a healthcare consulting firm in Abuja. Uh, basically, we carry out a lot of um, awareness and advocacy, a lot of programs on antimicrobial resistance to support the Nigerian Center for Disease Control. And um, also, I'm um, supporting the antimicrobial, the Commonwealth Pharmacies Association. I'm currently serving as um, one of the antimicrobial stewardship technical advisors for their Commonwealth of Commonwealth Partnership Extension Antimicrobial Stewardship Programs so across eight countries in Africa. Uh, so uh, based on um, what has been happening over the years in the antimicrobial resistance space, I'll be sharing with us uh, some, some, key take, some key highlights and um, take home points for us to use as pharmacists to join in the fight against antimicrobial resistance. Okay, so my outline, um, I'm talking to Leonard Collis, so um, I'll not I'm a more technicality. I'm talking to Leonard colleagues, so so I believe um, we are um, acquainted with some of uh, what is happening in the space in terms of you know the graduate pharmacy school, school days and even in our the current reality. So what I'm going to do, uh, my outline, I'm going to look at trying to bring to four, trying to bring into reality how bad the antimicrobial resistance situation is, because uh, most times uh, some of us might not be the portion to have worked with um, stakeholders or uh, clients in the space that have seen this, um, how bad this situation is. So I'm going to be bringing to four, uh, how bad antimicrobial resistance is, bringing in some examples of what has been happening and what the WHO is saying. So also going to be looking beyond AMR, we're on antibiotics, we're looking at antimicrobial resistance. And then I'll also be taking us through the global action on antimicrobials and what has been happening globally. And then Nigeria's response and progress so far. So it's going to be so more of like an overview, uh, trying to bring us to speed on what has been happening globally and um, looking at how pharmacists can play a major role to combat antimicrobials. And so at the end, uh, I am an antibiotic guardian and I also want us to take an antibiotic guardian pledge. So we're also going to commit to an action sort of or based on the different pillars of our national action plan to make very So we're going to look at areas in which we can fit in as pharmacists. Okay, so basically that's um, the outline, what the end outline entails for today's uh, program. Okay, going over to the next slide. Okay, so before I begin, uh, I want us to drop comments in the chat room. So we'll talk about, um, Antibiotic resistance, what comes to your mind? So when we talk about antibiotic resistance, what comes to your mind? So I want to see what one of you. Can I see the chat room? So can you help me out there? I'm not seeing the chat room. I don't know why. I can hear you. What's the challenge? Okay, no, I said um, they should put in the chat room what antibiotic resistance means to them. What one or two words. When we talk about antibiotic resistance, what does it mean? What what is that word that comes to you when we talk about antibiotic resistance? So for participants, just comment in the chat room. Yeah, let me look. Let me read some of the comments. Okay, from Benga Adeumi. First response. Yes, there is a response. Can you hear me? 
Can you hear me if I'm lost? Hello, fam love. I think we are having a little network. I can hear you. I think we lost him there. We are having a little network issues. So just hello. Hello guys. Sorry. Yes, I'm here. We have a little technical issues which we resolve immediately. Okay, okay, okay. Okay, so let's continue. You were trying to read comments in the chat room. Yes. I'll do that. So in the chat room, we have um, Benga Adewumi to, all, to us. So the first thing that comes to mind is possibility of treatment failure from Ekabu Yameni. Say that the first thing that comes to our mind whenever there, she hears the word antimicrobial resistance is on awareness. But we are still expecting more, still expecting more response from the audience. When you hear Anti-microbial anti resistance. Okay, great. What comes to your mind first? What comes to your mind first? Can you share your thoughts with us on the chat box? Do we have some love back? Yes, I'm back. All right, um, from love from Wenga. Uh, Wenga Adewumi said, the first thing that comes to his mind is possibility of treatment failure from Ekawu Yameni. He stated that some unawareness that comes to our mind first from pharmacist in MSCN, some misuse, that's the perception she has. Chukuka uh, said antibiotics not functioning anymore due to anymore. previous abuse. Then Nora said misuse. Yes. So Blessing thank you. Thank you. So a lot of them. Yeah. Responsive. So thank you very much, guys. Thank you. Please, I want it to be a very interactive session. We're all colleagues, so nobody's, uh, we're not being um, given exams. So please, let's, I'll try to make it very interactive because I'm going to be feeding us with information that uh, we don't see if some of us might be aware or majority of us are not aware of what's currently happening in this space. So I'd like us to make it very interactive. You can bring in your comments or just suggestions as uh, we progress. Okay, so thank you very much, guys. So when we talk about antibiotic resistance, what comes to your mind? Some people will say, okay, death. Some persons mentioned misuse. Some persons mentioned um, uh, not functioning anymore. So it's, it's a big challenge. We're talking about antibiotic resistance. Uh, antibiotics that ordinarily should be able to tackle infections no longer work due to resistance. So it's a global, it's a global, global challenge and it is, it is resulting to death as we speak. And then, so we're going to see that slides, uh, that's in a couple of slides ahead. Okay, so um, I'll be going next into the scary reality, trying to bring to, uh, trying to bring to our, our various areas and some of the things that are happening in terms of um, how bad the situation has been and it's still been, it's still ongoing. So it's, it's a very critical and bad situation. So um, some of the images are a bit, are a bit um, uh, disturbing. So um, uh, you might stop. If you're eating, you should just take away your food from where you are. Anyways, okay, so let's proceed. Okay, so before uh, 
penicillin was discovered by Sir Alexander and Fleming. We all know that um, penicillin was discovered uh, in 1928, uh, but before it was used was in 1942 clinically. So Alexander Fleming warned that um, uh, the thoughtless person playing with penicillin treatment is morally responsible for the death of the man. So he foresaw that resistance is going to occur definitely. He foresaw that this was going to happen and he also advised that um, the penicillin was to be used judiciously. Okay, so going into what is happening, this is, um, uh, I don't know if some of us might be familiar with this lady. She's very active on Twitter. Her name is Vanessa Carter. Uh, she had a accident, uh, a car accident back when she was 25 years old and it damaged her right eyes. And um, following the accident, uh, she didn't recover, she didn't recover properly and um, the eyes got infected, the eye got infected with methicillin resistant Staphylococcus aureus. It was that bad. She, she don't used to go out anymore. She used to hide her face. Uh, she was scared. She was even ashamed of her personality because it has, it has caused a lot of damage on her right eyes. She started bringing pus. She's been using a lot of antibiotics, but all to no avail. And um, it, um, so that resulted in to carry out uh, a facial reconstructive surgery. So we just imagine how many persons were able to, able to do that. So, but uh, she had the way without the means to be able to do that. So, but not all persons, not everyone will be able to do that. So she was able to get back uh, her right eye, but not completely. Not completely. Okay, so she's now a patient advocate, uh, trying to inform the members of our community in South Africa and the world globally of uh, the reality of our balance of microbial resistance and um, what they can do as um, actions to combat it. Okay, so going forward, um, what is the World Health Organization saying? Uh, the World Health Organization is saying antibiotics resistant could bring the end to modern medicine. So, so you see uh, antibiotics being used in the treatment of infections no longer working again, and you know what that that um, entails so death automatically if there are no other antibodies options. So that's what the WHO is saying, that end of modern medicine is coming closer if we don't do uh, higher collective actions against antimicrobial resistance. And now this is what is scary. Uh, it has been estimated, this is a review done in 2014 by the uh, UK government, commissioned by the UK government. So it was estimated that by 20, by 2050, there's going to be terminal deaths due to a antimicrobial resistance. Now you can see clearly from the screen, you notice that um, Africa is going to have the second large, the, the second largest burden. Asia is going to have the highest burden, second to have Africa. And then in the region, you see, you notice the, um, a section carved out within the West African region, Nigeria. So we know Nigeria is going to be a larger burden uh, due to antimicrobial resistance. And it implies that by 2050, one person is going to die every three seconds. One second. Okay, hold on, guys. Because of the network, let me turn off my video. Okay. Okay, great. Let me. Okay, so great. My video is off now. Let me continue. So this implies that by 2050, there's going to be one person dying every three seconds. And um, currently, it has been estimated that more than 700,000 deaths occur due to antimicrobial resistance. And there's been a lot of fuss about cancer, diabetes, non-communicable diseases. But from the estimations, look there. In to, by 2050, cancer is going to cost about 8 million deaths, which AMR is going to surpass. AMR is going to surpass deaths due to cancer, due to diabetes, due to other uh, infections. So it's a big, it's a big, big, big challenge. Okay, now this is a possibility. So the World Health Organization is saying bigger crisis than AIDS. So death from a minor crash is, is a possibility. So just imagine, um, just imagine you developing a minor injury. You use the normal antiseptics to clean and all of that. They fight treatment, and then you even take systemic oral antibiotics. They fight treatment, and um, it gets worse into a stage whereby you just have to amputate the the hand or the leg, as the case may be. We've seen scenarios like that. Uh, from uh, my director of pharmacy, Estelle, she, she was opportune to witness a scenario whereby uh, a patient had an injury on the legs that was got infected, defied all possible treatments, and almost at the point of getting amputated. So this, these things are happening, they are really, really happening, and it calls for a big concern globally for everyone to be up, uh, for everyone to take on the challenge. 
So this is uh, a patient back then in pre-antibiotic era. The patient came down with congenital syphilis, so there was no antibiotics at that time. So now what the world is, what the reality is looking at, if we don't collectively put actions together to combat antimicrobial resistance, we're going to a stage called the post-antibiotic era. So the post-antibiotic era whereby antibiotics no longer work and then treatment to uh, infections will become impossible. So we don't want to get to that stage. So that's why there's been a, glo a global uh, clamor on the rational use of antibiotics and getting all stakeholders involved, including the pharmaceutical sector. Okay, so going to the causes, uh, some of the causes of antibiotic resistance, uh, from the World Health Organization, you know over prescribing of antibiotics. I know pharmacists, especially community pharmacists, we are guilty of this. And I was thinking scenarios whereby because we want to make sales and uh, uh, we give patients that sometimes patients don't even need this antibiotics, we just give patients this antibiotics, give them broad spectrum antibiotics and able to make sales for the day, which are some of the practices that are actually increasing the risk, the risk of antibiotic resistance and why pharmacists have a major role to play in this. Then patients still not finishing their treatment, healthcare professionals still also cooperate in this regard. I know some of us don't even, when we are well, we just stop halfway, we don't take antibiotics, we don't finish antibiotics. So, uh, so that is also a major challenge. Patient not finishing antibiotic is also a major challenge. Then overuse of antibiotics in livestock and fish farming. So we've seen cases because I've been opportunity to work with the one health team from the Federal Ministry of Agriculture and Environment. Uh, we've seen cases whereby uh, we've seen reports, publications of antibiotics abuse in the animal sectors. So some antibiotics are being used as good promoters. That's are being used as prophylactic. And these animals are not down. They're just giving these antibiotics just prophylactically. And then we've seen cases whereby these antibiotics, these animals are being slaughtered. And um, the, the withdrawal period in which these antibiotics is once to get all of these animal products, ingest them, and then take on these antibiotic residues, which and the future also have potential arm on us. So there's a lot of practices. So that's why combating antimicrobial resistance is a one health approach. So you see the overuse of antibiotics in lifestyle and fish farming have an effect on uh, human health as well. So poor infection control in hospitals and clinics is a major challenge. And then lack of hygiene and poor sanitation too, with lack of new antibiotics being developed. So these are major challenges affecting the rise of antibiotic resistance. So like I mentioned earlier, antibiotic resistance in the animal uh, sector. So you, this is antibiotics being given to animals and then antibiotics are being killed, used as, um, uh, used, consumed by humans. And some of these antibiotics uh, are not, the without period, like I mentioned initially, are not being observed. And these antibiotic residues are being found uh, in, in this in these products we, we consume. Interestingly, let me chalk you uh, the the team from the Federal Minister they noted that these residues, once they are being found in some of these animal products we consume, even boiling them from now to tomorrow, these residues don't even go away. This residue doesn't even go away and we end up ingesting them. So you just consider yourself, just imagine a scenario whereby you ingest a suboptimal level of penicillin, of ampicillin, or tetracycline that was given to animals. So just imagine what will happen in the after in, in the long run. So we've seen cases whereby even in the abattoirs where these animal products are being sold, research have reviewed, evidence have shown that um, we go to these areas, we get these animal products and also ingest, ingest them as well too. So it's a whole big challenge and um, uh, no one is spared on the Hello guys, unfortunately I was disconnected. 
Can you hear me now? Yes, yes we can hear you. Okay. Sorry, let me continue. So you heard of so this extent, right? So talking about the resistance. Uh, and from my companies, right? Yes, can you please continue with the last slide? Hello everyone, we are having a little um, network glitch here. So we'll be back in a very short time. Um, I really need to thank you all for the patience exhibited so far. From love, are you there? Okay, I think my network is a bit stable. Can you hear me clearly now? Yes, pretty well. Okay, great. Sorry, uh, my network. I'm trying to switch network up. My network is a bit unstable initially. Okay, so let's um, let me share back my screen. All right. Okay, so looking at what is happening in terms of uh, the pharmaceutical industry, uh, the pharma companies are saying they can't develop a particular molecule, a new antibiotics, where resistance is going to occur in the next two years. So usually most times they're like, their return on investment is not being seen, and most of them are no longer interested in uh, developing new antibiotic molecules. If you look at this timeline from when penicillin was developed, till now about 2020 or there about, there are no new antibiotic molecules being developed. So it's a, it's, it's a big cause for worry, it's a big cause for concern. So that's why the global body, the UN, the World Organization uh, and other partners, the developed what they call, they, they created an alliance for the pharma companies to look at how to incentivize, incentivize them on um, developing new molecules and try to see how uh, even after development of these new antibiotic molecules, they put in place measures to ensure its rational use. So it's a big challenge because the pharma companies are like, guys, we can't keep on pumping money into research of antibiotic molecules. And the next year, the next two years, it goes out of market. So it's a big concern for everyone globally. Okay, so let's look at antimicrobial resistance beyond antibiotics. So what's happening? Okay, so antibiotic resistance, as we all know, is a resistance to all encompassing bacterial, fungal, viruses been no longer effective against um, the use of antimicrobials. So you notice that um, uh, this is a natural phenomenon, as we all know. Humans and microorganisms are constantly fighting for survival. So it's a natural unstoppable phenomenon. But there are, there are things that we, there are habits, there are practices that we should engage in to tend to uh, limit uh, the spread of antimicrobial resistance. So basically, it's been estimated that more than 50% of antibiotics are prescribed inappropriately. So you might have seen that in, if you're working in the hospital settings and um, even in your community pharmacy environment, the system of these prescriptions are coming. So most patients have um, a lot of patients, even healthcare professionals as well, to poor compliance to treatment. And more than half of the population do not have access to essential antibiotics. So that's where pharmacists have a major role to play in ensuring the rational use and also rational access to some of these antibiotics. And um, more than 50% of antibiotics are being used in countries as animal growth promoters, like I mentioned earlier on. So these are some of the major challenges. And then the world is talking about sustainable development goals. And we know with antimicrobial resistance, sustainable development goals have, uh, IMR have an effect 
on the sustainable development goals. So you'll be looking at uh, no poverty, SDG one. Let's look at, for instance, no poverty. Like um, the like case I mentioned of the lady that uh, came down with MRSA, resistant organism. If you were to be uh, maybe a middle class or a poor patient, uh, they would it should have probably left untreated and then taking the eyes of the patient and in worst case scenario, the patient might have died. So we've seen cases whereby uh, uh, our good health and well-being is being threatened by antimicrobial resistance. Ordinarily, what Ampiclos could solve, you have to get a very higher class of antibiotics. So these are the issues on ground now and um, it's threatening uh, the achievement of sustainable development goals. And that's where Universal Health Coverage that talks about Get, making healthcare care available for all. And then um, when you don't have effective treatment to treat bacterial infections or infections of um, uh, microorganisms, as the case may be, definitely your health, the universal health coverage is no longer possible. So antimicrobial is not threatened uh, the achievement of universal health coverage. It threatens effective treatment, threatens the achievement of universal health coverage. So this is a big challenge globally. And that's why there's been a global force about um, uh, joining forces globally to combat antimicrobial resistance. So let's quickly take you through what has been happening on the global space. Uh, let me bring you up to speed of what has been happening in the global space, how uh, the uh, global body came about developing action plans and then uh, bringing together stakeholders and nations and countries to tackle antimicrobial resistance. So in 2014, the World Health Organization did the Global Surveillance Report to address antimicrobial resistance. Uh, it was observed that uh, most countries are not even taking global, they're not even measuring antibiotic resistance. They don't even know they're not even aware of what antimicrobial is and how bad the situation was. And then following the UK report, uh, the, the Jim one report that I mentioned 250 by 250, there's gonna be 10 million deaths. So following that report, uh, in 2050, the World Health Organization, the World Health Assembly endorsed global action to tackle antimicrobial resistance. And um, so following that in 2016, 193 countries signed the UN declaration to, talk, to take action on AMR. So that's where Nigeria got involved. The then Honorable Minister of Health was in that meeting. And then that was where Nigeria uh, started concert, started efforts, concerted efforts against antimicrobial resistance. So the National Technical Working Group, uh, the Antimicrobial Resistance Center, the Nigerian Center for Disease Control was constituted in that 2016 and January 2017. So in 2018, there's been a lot of discussions around multi-drug resistance TB at the UN, high level on ending TB. And then um, also 2017, uh, the UN Interagency Work Group, headed by our then Minister of Environment, Amina Mohamed, she uh, coordinated uh, developed sort of a roadmap looking at how to bring in multi-sectoral collaborations to tackle antimicrobial resistance. So a lot has been happening in the global space and um, with, 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 the, with the estimation, uh, if if this space is not being continued like this, it's going to be very, very devastating. So that's why it's a lot of action. And recently, in 2020, the World Health Organization included antimicrobial resistance as, as one of the 13 urgent challenges. And then in 2021, that's been listed as one of the top 10 global health challenges. And so what the Young Pharmacist Group was trying to do now is, is welcoming and it's timely, and um, it's going to bring your efforts to limelight as part of the contributors to supporting the global efforts on the fight against antimicrobial resistance. So looking at what has happened in the country, Nigeria has a five-year uh, AMR strategic framework. So I don't know if many of us are aware of this. So part of the plan, the first, the plan has uh, five pillars. The first pillar is on increasing awareness and knowledge on antimicrobial resistance. Before this plan was developed, a situation analysis was conducted and a SWOT, uh, a SWOT analysis of the country AMR status quo was done that informed this. So these five pillars is also in alignment to the global action plan on antimicrobial resistance. So the first, we have increasing awareness on knowledge on AMR-related topics. Those who have one health AMR surveillance and research is the second pillar. Then the third pillar is strengthening infection prevention and control in the tripartite sector. And then the fourth pillar is looking at promoting rational access to antibiotics and stewardship. And then the fourth pillar is investing in research and development. So pharmacists has uh, a major role to play in all of these pillars. And, and um, we'll be looking at and we'll be looking at this going forward. We'll be looking at this going forward in terms of uh, our call to action, what roles we have to play in that regard. Okay, so this is our goal. So the goal of the national plan, Nigeria's national action plan is to reduce, prevent, and possibly slow the emergence of resistant organisms while ensuring optimal use and improve access to quality antimicrobials that will be effective, safe, and quality assured for continued successful treatment of infections. 
So we did the CITAN and following the CITAN, the situation analysis in 2017, uh, we observed that there's a lot, a lot, lot of uh, over the counter uh, access to antibiotics. More than this 42% is even under estimation. So it's even higher than this. If you go any nook and cranny, you can even pick antibiotics over the counter. And um, so it was also observed from the systematic review done that less than children less than five years were given on prescribed antibiotics for diarrhea. Most times, in some cases, are just um, virus and um, they are self limiting. And also, it's, been, it's also been observed, it was observed during the systematic review uh, that was done that um, caregivers of children less than five years old presenting with such food. I know in our situation, in our community pharmacies environment, we've seen this patients coming on board. Uh, clients come in to request for antibiotics for such real, or if you don't give them the this kind of this particular antibiotics, they want to leave and all of that. The case may be so. I know we might have encountered such scenarios, and um, it's 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 in our place as pharmacists to to give appropriate advice uh, as that when needed. So also we also notice there's a marked resistance to all drugs commonly prescribed for utilize. It's a big challenge, major challenge, re resistance to E. coli and um, some other organism causing urinary tract infections. So let me just quickly give us a rundown, a breakdown of what has been happening in terms of the Nigerian EMR response. Like I mentioned initially, following the 2016 uh, declaration by the UN, in 2017, uh, the National Antimicrobial Resistant Technical Working Group was developed, a one health, so one health approach. Like I mentioned, anti the, the animal sector is not left aside, the human sector and then the environment. Uh, so in 2017, we started the development of Nigeria's national plan on antimicrobial resistance. So all countries were charged to come up with a national plan and submit by 2017 in the world uh, uh, to the World Health Assembly. That was in 2015. But Nigeria started theirs at the end of 2016 by beginning of January 2017. So we were able to. It was a whole lot of work, like pulling together stakeholders and then my organization through. Uh, the GAP project, we supported this process in the country. So we're part of the stakeholders, the team that worked together in developing Nigeria's next national plan to make resistance. And we successfully submitted that uh, at the 78th World Health Assembly. So following that, um, the World Health Organization came to the country. They want to know how it was possible for us to develop a national national plan at that short frame. And then looking at funding means, so where are we going to get funding to implement some of this plan? And then um, who are those stakeholders that are carrying out activities in different sectors? And how do we now integrate all of that into our national action plan? So that was the case study that was done in 2017. And then in 2018, the Fleming Fund, I don't know if you've heard of the Fleming Fund. The Fleming Fund is the largest fund that has been disbursed globally by the UK government to support activities uh, uh, in low, middle income countries to tackle antimicrobial resistance. So Nigeria is a recipient of the Fleming Fund. So currently, as we speak, there are a lot of activities on the go, ongoing in the Fleming Fund Fleming Fund activities to support Nigeria in implementing a national national plan. So with the formerly Fleming Fund, Nigeria has been doing, doing a lot of trainings and infection provision and control, a lot of um, development of uh, uh, infection provision guidelines and work uh, and workbook for healthcare professionals. And um, so there's something called the GLASS, the Global Antimicrobial Surveillance System, of which Nigeria enrolled in 2017 and um, started um, submitting data on antimicrobial resistance, of which it was not there at the initial. I'm going to talk more on the glass in um, subsequent slides. Okay, so in terms of the antimicrobial resistant awareness, nothing has been happening initially uh, prior before 2017. But in 2017, when we submitted the national action plan, uh, for the first time in Nigeria, we had the one health antimicrobial resistant uh, awareness during the World Antibiotics Awareness Week. So that was the first time it happened in the country. And um, subsequently, organizing the Antibiotic Awareness Week that happens every uh, second week of November. So this was the second one that was up, that happened. I also did um, subsequently in 2019. Then in 2020, we just did some online activities. So my organization, Discipline Solutions, we've been doing a lot in this space. We've been doing a lot in the space. We've been um, involved in um, carrying out a lot of uh, capacity building amongst healthcare professionals. Also organizing a series of lectures for the Nigerian field Epidemiology training program uh, 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 students. So these are the NFL tips, some of the NFL tips, Nigerian feed epidemiology training program uh, uh, students that we had um, AMR workshop, a three days AMR workshop on. So we've been carrying a lot of activity in the area. Also training healthcare professionals, organizing masterclass training for healthcare professionals as well. So disability solutions have been doing a lot uh, under the antimicrobial resistance awareness pillar. 
trying to see how we bridge this gap because there's a lot of gap in awareness, like someone mentioned, poor awareness in the space. So there's a lot of poor awareness. And uh, what YPG is trying to do now, it's, it's going to go a long way to also bridge that gap too. And uh, you cannot do it in silo, you need collaboration. So you bring in as many partners, as many uh, experts in the areas to support the work you're doing. Okay, so uh, part of what we conceptualized in 2019 was the Youth Against Antibiotic Misuse Project. And um, so part of the project, we noticed that um, the youth, Nigerian youth, form the bulk population of the country, about 70% of our population are youth and we have to think of how to use utilize this youth population to advance the MR agenda in the country so this uh, I led this with my team uh, we developed a sort of a concept and we started the pilot implementation so the first was engaging with the schools secondary schools in Abuja to so try to pilot um, the quiz and debate session and also sort of organize a seminar for them and it was interesting to note that these students uh, did a lot of research and came to present their findings on the uh, during the debate session. So part of the debate, the part of the, the debate topic on the on the final day was um, enforcing a ban on over-the-counter use of antibiotics is the most effective way to control antimicrobial resistance. So some were opposing and some were proposing motion. Now, if you look at the image, this guy on the middle, the guy went to the pharmacy to for, to, to buy some of these antibiotics just to buttress his his points, just to prove that. Antibiotics, there are no there are no control of antibiotics. You can just get to any pharmacy, any chemist shop, and just get antibiotics without even prescriptions. And then this are some of the activities that are like giving rise to antibiotics and resistance. And this um uh so this project was actually submitted. There's this there's this yearly activity called the Antibiotic Guardians Award by the UK government, and so we submitted it uh, as an entry and it was shortlisted among other uh uh, competitive um, among other, it was also shortlisted among other organizations under the children and uh, family category. So at the end, um, a I think Drasa Drasa from Nigeria won with the also they did this, they presented a school project. Drasa won that, and then ourselves and Pfizer we highly commended for a project involving schools and trying to see how we carry everyone along. Okay, looking at MR surveillance, like I mentioned initially, Nigeria for the first time submitted data on GLASS. So GLASS stands for the Global Antimicrobial Surveillance System. So we have um, participating laboratories that are submitting data on GLASS. And so before this data on GLASS has been submitted, uh, sort of an assessment of the laboratory standards were done and then um, following which they were not selected. And so these are some of the priority WHO organism list they are monitoring. So you see a lot of carbapenem resistant organisms uh, monitoring and personally resistant like my saying as the case may be. So these are some of the organisms that have been monitored and submitted to the WHO uh, surveillance center. So this is to inform uh, new development of molecules against some of these uh, antibiotics resistant species. So that's the whole essence of collecting data. So if you don't have this data, it will not be informed, you will not be able to inform actions against um, antibiotic resistance. So coming to young pharmacies, to pharmacists, we have a major role to play because we are custodians of medic medicines and we are the most accessible healthcare professionals. So we have major roles to play and we have to, to be at the forefront of the fight against antibiotic resistance globally. So uh, you, you might want to ask, where do you start? So where do you want to start in a global fight? So with the pillars of the National National Plan, we, we, we have the five pillars, like I mentioned earlier. The first is the awareness pillar. The second is the infection prevention and control pillar. The third is the surveillance pillar. And then you also have the antimicrobial stewardship and then research. So pharmacies have a role to play in all of this. So subsequent slides are going to portray some of these roles and then um, going to sparkle your interest on which of them you might want to uh, go on further to, to engage in. Mind you, this, uh, each of these pillars uh, they're very, very elaborate. Um, they are, they're very, very elaborate. They are they're standalone courses on their own. That usually when we organize trainings, we bring in subject experts in different areas. So what I'm going to do, I'm just going to give us sort of an overview uh, to further arouse our interest in the area. And um, maybe if you're interested in doing further work in the space, I'm going to share resources that also guide you in that regard. Okay. Yeah, so thank you. So let me continue. So going to awareness. Pharmacies has a lot of role to play in awareness. So we, like I mentioned initially, uh, we have um, we are the most accessible care professionals via our comment from our outlets. So we should use that as a means to uh, carry out promotion and rational antibiotic use. And then um, also 
we should also engage in air promotion campaigns. And um, it's a good thing the YPG has started this. It's a very, very good project. And one thing I want them to incorporate is trying to see how you evaluate your, your progress of activities. So you try to note, okay, how many coverage have we had so far? So have there been engagement rates and all of that? So you also guide your actions when you're writing your reports. So pharmacists have a major role to play in awareness. So in our little capacity, even within our homes, our communities, uh, in the place, our place of work, we should advocate for rational use of antibiotics. And um, interestingly, there are some young pharmacy students then, uh, that was in 2019, pharmacy students were engaged in, um, pharmacists and some other healthcare professionals, they, on Twitter, they engaged, uh, uh, they started this campaign, this hashtag, 100 days awareness on antimicrobial resistance. It's interesting to know that, um, they started and they actually saw it to the end. It was really, it was actually led by DBC Yusuf. So he's now a pharmacist. So they started a campaign and then it, it drew the attention of the director general of the Nigerian Center for Disease Control. So very proud. So he made, he commented, he made mention of the fact that um, very proud to see this activity ongoing. So with what your YPG they are doing, it's, it's a very welcome development and commendable one. So please guys, I encourage you not to stop and try to see how to, uh, to sort of okay, as the case may be, to loud it out and then get more patients on board. So if you want to do media outlets, amplify your voices on Twitter. And also, go, I'll also comment some of our colleagues that are using their platforms like for, to talk on this. Um, we have Farm Radio, we have um, Health Tips with Lyo, and then Farm Barrett and some other colleagues that are talking, and in one way or the other, talking about antimicrobial resistance. So I also encourage all of us to so keep talking and never get tired. So awareness, we also have a real major, major role to play in antimicrobial resistance awareness. So looking at surveillance, for pharmacists, we have major role to play in surveillance, but we're not looking at laboratory resistant surveillance. So we're looking at surveillance in two aspects. As pharmacists, we're looking at the quantitative surveillance of antibiotic resistance, of antibiotic use, sorry, antibiotic consumption. And then you're looking at the qualitative measures. Like I mentioned, uh, in the collective measures, you're looking at auditing the antibiotic prescribing practice pattern. So is there an uh, indication of a start and end date? What uh, is there, was there a doses trend written in the prescription and some of those prescribing uh, parameters? Like I mentioned initially, these are courses, are standalone courses, you don't even finish for one day. So how to carry out antimicrobial monitoring consumption, uh, how to carry out audit of antibiotic prescribing practices, and also aid pharmacies in that, especially in the antimicrobial consumption, and because we have a lot of we, we have a lot of record, a lot of data in our pharmacies outlets, or be it hospital pharmacy, community pharmacy settings, but we are not actually annexing or using this data appropriately. So uh, because the WHO wants to make sure that uh, healthcare facilities are being assisted to streamline the use of antibiotics and also ensure that they institutionalize antimicrobial stewardship uh, programs. What uh, the WHO came up with in 2019 was an essential medicine list for antibiotics. I don't know if you are aware of that. So the essential medicine list for antibiotics are further classified antibiotics into three categories. You have the access, the wash, and the reserve. So as pharmacists in our different uh, locality, be it in the community pharmacy, in the hospital setting, you can actually be collecting data in this regard. So you have your sales record. I remember when I was doing my uh, my service at one of the hospitals in FCT Abuja here. Yeah? So we usually have this record whereby we take note of antibiotics, um, uh, the, the type of antimicrobials dispensed. So take note of the strength and all of that. So we could also use that to inform a uh, sort of a report or a publication in this, in this regard. So what WHO is saying for the access, these are first line of antibiotics that should be readily available and should be used in outpatient settings anywhere. So there should be no restrictions. But the wash and the reserve are usually should be restricted and should be used for lane prescriptions. And then the reserve should be on the last, last, last resort when they are resistance to the first and the, and the second, that's the first at the access and the wash. When they are resistance to these categories of antibiotics, then you bring in a reserve. So in your facility, you could actually look at this, uh, start collecting data in this regard. Part of the research I'm currently doing from the grant I won uh, from the Royal Society for Tropical Medicine and Hygiene, uh, I'm actually collecting data. I'm done with the data collection anyways. I looked at looking at the different FCT hospitals, trying to look at um, the outpatient prescriptions and trying to categorize categorize the data, the uh, uh, prescriptions data. So trying to say, okay, how often do they prescribe antibiotics in access category as against antibiotics in the wash category? So which of these antibiotics are consumed mostly uh, in, each, uh, in each month, in each quarter, in this case maybe. So all of these will now inform additional investigation. So in your community pharmacy setting, you could just collect that, okay, this is your logbook. You could look at the records, it's this book, as 
and take note of oh, we have a lot of antibiotics being prescribed spread over uh, a lot of access or wash with antibiotics being prescribed. So you could do a publication in that regard, especially in the hospital settings. If you notice in outpatient settings, you're having a lot of prescriptions from the wash and the reserve group of antibiotics. You could want to investigate for that with the lab. Is there a laboratory investigation that was done to necessitate this? So this could now uh, give rise to further investigations, set up committees and try to see how we now institutionalize or rationalize antibiotic use in the area. So these are some activities pharmacists can actually play an important role in. And then the global point prevalence survey. So these are the qualitative measures I mentioned about. So you could read further about it. You want not to know, know more further about the global point prevalence survey. The link is there. And I'm going to ensure you have the slides at the end of the presentation. So the global point prevalence survey, uh, this you're looking at now, now you're not looking at uh, prescribing an indicators. You're trying to see, okay, uh, is there a start to end date? Uh, is there the doses trend written? Some, uh, some, some doctors don't even write the generic, they just write the brand names, or they just include, uh, they just include the dose without, okay, when is, it, when is the patient going to finish? This regimen is not complete, you don't have the, uh, the strength. So there are a lot of missing uh, small details of, uh, small details you wash out for when you're kind of the global prime prevalence survey. So these are, these, these, these are activities pharmacies can actually carry out and engage in and them. Um, Currently in the country, the Nigerian Center for Disease Control, they are piloting a point prevention of some selected facilities, trying to collect data and answer about the prescribing patterns. And this will now inform uh, decisions regarding uh, uh, standard, standardized, regarding uh, institutionalizing standard treatment guidelines and then come up with any measures to help to control prescribing practices of, of prescribers. Okay, so going over to the next one, um, infection prevention control. So pharmacies also have a role to play. So there's some, the, in, in facilities, you have the infection prevention control committees. So this image on your, that you're seeing right now is um, part of what we did with a facility in, in, uh, in, facility in Abuja. So we tried to institutionalize an antimicrobial, sorry, institutionalize an infection prevention control committee. And then pharmacy is also a key member of that committee too. So pharmacy has a major role to play. And with the advent of uh, COVID-19, uh, infection prevention control has been overemphasized and is still being emphasized. So and hygiene and um, ensuring the ensuring our proper and our proper and hygiene. And so it's for those of us that work in community in, in the hospital settings. So uh, the WHO created five moments of hand hygiene. So why when when to use your hand sanitizers. So you see before touching the patient, before cleaning the septic procedures, after body full exposures, after touching patient surroundings, even uh, some of our dispensing tables, some patients come there, they sit down and you talk. So that place ought, ought to be wiped regularly at regular intervals and stuff like that. So maintaining uh, uh, an hygiene practices is also going to be a long, go a long way to also support um, uh, the fight against antibiotic resistance. And again, pharmacy has a major role to play in um, anti sanitizer production. So with the with the, with, the, with the pandemic, we saw a lot of pharmacy units producing hand sanitizers in bulk quantities. And so, in our little way, in our little facilities, wherever we find ourselves in, pharmacists um, can also lead in this regard to support the global fight of antibiotic resistance. So, looking into antimicrobial stewardship, so this is where pharmacy plays a major role. And I mentioned antimicrobial stewardship uh, is a it's a very broad area that um, usually we have um, facilitators bringing experts in the field that come to train healthcare professionals on what they need to do. So we're looking at antimicrobial stewardship. Antimicrobial stewardship entails a set of coordinated intervention designed to improve and measure antibiotic use. So uh, the goal is basically involve improving patient outcomes, uh, and ensuring patient safety, and then reducing, health, reducing resistance and healthcare costs. So the UK institutionalized this um, treatment algorithm, sort of a start smart and then focus. So usually most times in our facilities, you find out that patients, when patients are rushing to uh, being admitted, I don't know if some of us have noticed this in the inpatient settings. Um, the first, as they just come in, you just give them prospective antibiotics, cetrazone. And sometimes the prescription is just open. Uh, they just take it for one day and then they switch over. So some of these practices are not are not uh, proper. So some of these things are what actually leads to antibiotic resistance. So uh, usually in, in institutionalized antimicrobial worship programs, so there are different interventions you look into. So you're trying to, before institutionalizing any antimicrobial stewardship program, trying to understand what are the practices that are prevalent in that scenario. Is there, are there a lot of prescriptions that are, uh, there are a lot of prescriptions that are not sticking to guidelines? 
I read a lot of prescriptions that are just open. I read a lot of prescriptions that don't even contain uh, the dose. I read a lot of underdose and underdose. They prescriptions that are not being vetted from the lab. So all of that, they're not being guided from laboratory investigation. So all of this will now inform what antimicrobial stewardship um, measures to put in place. But in our own little uh, uh, role as pharmacists, even in our community pharmacy settings, um, usually most time before we, we advise patients to, to begin any antibiotic treatment, it's usually advisable to encourage them to use, uh, to go for a laboratory test. And then in those two settings, you also have um, uh, antimicrobial stewardship programs and then being led by pharmacists. You also have pharmacists led antimicrobial stewardship program. You also have an experienced infectious disease physician led. So these are the committee members that comprises of uh, uh, the antimicrobial stewardship committees of which pharmacists has a major role to play uh, in antimicrobial stewardship. So you have nurses, microbiologists, and all other members of, uh, of the team. Okay, so for those persons that are working in the hospitals, some of us that are doing internship that are finished or maybe probably working in the hospitals at the moment, uh, you might be thinking, how do I start? So I want to maybe, I want to begin looking at working, trying to collect data in the, in, in the hospital settings. So how do you go about it? So it's important for you to note that in the hospital settings, it's a different game entirely. So you have to work with the multidisciplinary team. So if you looked at the uh, previous uh, pillars, the IPC, you have the IPC committees, you also, the antimicrobial stewardship, you have the antimicrobial stewardship committee. So you don't work in silos, rather you work as a group of team, as a team. So you have the medical doctors and the rest. So for, you want to start facilitating a multidisciplinary action on antimicrobial resistance, be it in the hospital setting. So now you are having the big, you're posing a big question. There's a big question of, okay, how do you go from not present in your facility, you don't have anything at all. So there's nothing. So how do you go from nothing to having a full AMR control program? So it's, it's worthy to mention that First, there has to be a will. So you, there has to be a will. So you have to want to improve the situation you've been observing, and uh, probably so probably there's a need for you to do this, for you to carry out this um, uh, this intervention. So there has to be a need, and there has to be that uh, willpower. So there has to be someone that that leads this activity. So before that, but there are also some other activities that need to happen prior before commencement of any antimicrobial resistant control activities in the facility in the hospitals. In which pharmacists can play a major role. Okay, so before I proceed, I want to ask this question. Uh, for some of us, uh, in one way or the other, we might have had experience working in the hospital. Just for instance, you want to start up uh, an MR control program in your facility. Uh, so which among these um, options do you think will be the, uh, will the most appropriate? Which of these options do you think uh, will make the most difference in setting up MR control programs in your facility? So please, I want to see our responses in the chat box. So let me see what you think. So you want to begin an, an AMR control program in your facility. So which among these options do you think um, uh, we give the program um, the needed um, trend it will need? Hello guys, are we together? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Okay, there's an okay, there's an answer for okay, there's an answer from the chat box. Someone is choosing D, another A. Sorry, I'm not seeing, okay. Okay, can you see them now, sir? Okay, I can see them now. Okay, somebody okay. said four, is that four A? Okay, A, B, Some somebody said B. Okay, I want to see more B. Okay. So what core element do you think has, Made the most difference is not BMR control program. So we'll make the most difference. If you want to set say my control program, so D, regular reporting antibodies and resistance. Okay, so great. So we have varied responses. And um, uh, let me give, tell us the answer. So the answer is A, leadership commitment. So uh, this has been seen in um, pro in facilities whereby antimicrobial stewardship uh, has been institutionalized. So you note that leadership commitment is very key, very, very key uh, to the support of any antimicrobial stewardship program. You have to get the leaders buy-in. So even from your from the pharmacy department, you have to get the buy-in of your unit head and then the buy-in of the head of department. And then of which you now go on to the, uh, the buy-in of the other leadership of the respective department, the nursing department, the medical team. So you have to identify focal persons uh, leadership in those areas. So the leadership commitment is very, very key to ensure 
uh, the success of any AMR control program or whatsoever you want to do. So start from the pharmacy department, then you also go to the respective um, departments of other healthcare professionals, and then the CMD. So for programs that have PSK um, piloted an antimicrobial stewardship program in the University of Ibadan, and then so uh, following the pilot, it was noted that the leadership commitment saw the advancement of the program to a greater level. Okay, so yeah, bear, bearing that into mind, so there's this is a stepwise process. So if you want to begin any activity, especially in the hospital settings, uh, you just this, this is a stepwise process, a guide on how to go about facilitating a multidisciplinary call to action on antimicrobial resistance. So, like I mentioned initially, you have to mobilize support. You can't go solo. You have to identify focal persons that are gatekeepers in each of these departments. So you have to have bodies, friends, colleagues uh, in the respective departments in the hospital settings. So, you mobilize support, try to uh, present your findings to them, give them a justifiable reasons why you think um, this is what is happening. So before you're able to do that, you have to understand what the local situation is. So are there a lot of, uh, have you been noticing a lot of prescriptions that are very, that are open-ended? Have you been looking at a lot of prescriptions that don't even have a start and end date, that don't even have, um, have you been noticing more of IV prescriptions against oral? Have you noticed? So some of these uh, obs uh, observances, you have to take note of to form your, your, your case for, for the need for AMR control programs. Or maybe if you, maybe you investigated for them, find at the lab, many persons are not even using laboratory investigations reports to prescribe. Many prescribers are just using, uh, maybe if a pharmaceutical company comes to, um, to detail the product to them and just start dispensing that. So all of these um, irrational practices, if you take note of some of these practices, or even if in, your, in the pharmacy settings, you're collecting, you, normally you record data, uh, daily data, drug dispense daily and all of that. So you could now take a look at the drug dispense. So you look at, oh, a lot of reserve group of antibiotics were dispensed over this period of time. So that calls for questioning. So all of these information, you need to understand what the local situation is before you be able to push for any course of action. And then following that, you now formulate a plan, you develop a plan of action. So your plan must be smart, specific, measurable, achievable, realistic, and as a defined timeline. So formulate your plan, you also have to implement the action plan. So again, you cannot implement it in silos. You have to, it's a teamwork. Fully implementing, so how do you monitor and evaluate your plan to ensure success, uh, to ensure success? So this is just an image of um, a sample plan. So for instance, um, their goal, their objective is to establish an annual training program for staff on waste management. So what are some of the plan activities? We want to implement that. That's their objective. So the objectives must tally with your, your methodology, must tally with how, your plan activities must tally with how you want to achieve that process. So since the staff, to become aware of the scope of the problem. Then who's going to be in charge? When do you want to do it? How will it be going to be measured and stuff like that? So these are some of the integrities you need to get involved with uh, when drafting a plan. So it's not something you do on silos, you, you work as a team. And usually our courses, when we design programs for trainings for healthcare professionals, we bring experts in different areas, experts that have been working on my best stewardship, experts that have been working in and the respective pillars to come and teach healthcare professional things, even starting on how to draft the work plan, work goals, and all of that. So we cannot we cannot use one hour or half a day or 30 minutes to talk about all of this in details. Okay, so pharmacists also have a major role to play in research and development. So we've been looking at the different pillars and the roles we have to play. So we could look at, um, like I mentioned initially, I mentioned awareness. We have a major role to play in awareness, infection provision and control. Uh, stewardship. They also mentioned, talked about surveillance of antibiotic use and then research. So interesting things are uh, the NIMPRI, that's the National Institute of Pharmaceutical Research and Development. They're doing a lot of looking at alternatives to antibiotics. So Professor uh, Professor Lado in the NIMPRI, he is actually doing a lot. They're actually doing a lot of work in that area, trying to look at alternatives. And then some group of uh, uh, scientists. Uh, they're also looking at uh, bringing phages, uh, innovating phages, and also to a substitute, and also you have probiotics to a substitute, alternatives to antibiotics, and then vaccines. So pharmacists can also work in the research space. And um, if you're interested in research, to further any research in the area. So you could also venture in that area and try to see what's happening and what alternatives exist in that regard. Okay, so this is an innovation by pharmacists. So this hackathon that is usually being done by Epiafrid. So the pharmacists actually designed this sunny band. So it contains refillable uh, hand sanitizers uh, that can be that can be put on by healthcare professionals for ease of accessibility and all of that. So he actually won that 
uh, hackathon that was done by FBI. I think that was in 2018, 2019, I can't recall exactly. And also a pharmacist too, uh, he is my colleague uh, presently at the Commonwealth Pharmacists Association. Uh, he actually designed this um, app, he designed this app to guide um, uh, the rational use of antibiotics in hospital settings. So most especially if you have a uh, treatment with infections and as the case may be, so what, what antibiotics would you use? Which of the antibiotics would be appropriate for that particular uh, for that particular group of antibiotics, for that particular case. And also there's also the aware antimicrobials. So, so pharmacists are doing a lot. And also some of us might be interested in digital space. Some of us might be interested in other areas. So you could use your, your interest and passion and try to see how you bring it on board to, uh, to be innovative about it, to combat antimicrobial resistance. So we show which some of our colleagues are, are leading in that regards too. So my wrap up top, uh, I want to, this is an hypothetical situation as a wrap up. Now, this is a lady, this is a woman. She has been looking for a child for like 10 years. And um, before she now finally got a baby. So what happened is this, the baby now fell ill, uh, developed an infection, and they were managing it with antibiotics. The infection was not even, uh, was not responding to treatment at all. And uh, so following further investigation, the investigation revealed this, uh, that the baby the child was resistant to all known antibiotics. And um, you know what, will definitely happen at the end. So the baby later died and um, yeah, so the baby later died. The woman has been looking for a child for 10 years. Eventually she had one and then the baby developed uh, an infection that was resistant to all known antibiotics. So this is the present scenario. This is what is happening as we speak at the moment. And um, so it's really, really scary. And um, it's uh, it's something that all ants must be on deck, all ants. Um, we've seen cases where people say, oh, I don't use antibiotics, so it does not affect me. No, 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 no. So what, the, the misuse of antibodies done by A affects what happens by, affect, affect Mr. B, whether Mr. B consumed antibodies or not. So it's the bacteria that is resistant, not the human body. So this resistant bacteria spreads. So this resistant bacteria spreads. And there was one challenge that happened sometime last year, that was two years ago, a 10 year challenge. So uh, the, the AMR space started looking at uh, sensitivity testing. So 10 years before, what was happening? And 10 years now, what was the situation? If you look at the image by the at the lower left, you notice that a lot of resistant uh, uh, resistance is spreading fast. So ten years from now, just imagine what the case would be. We pray God we don't we don't go into a post antibiotic era whereby uh, this antibiotic is no longer be uh, available. We will not be effective to treat uh, antibiotics anymore. Okay, just a comic relief. And um, so here is um, a resistant bacteria, the one on the at. And then there's the other one with that, that, that does not have a resistant gene or just growing on its, on its own. So the resistant bacteria was like, hey, kiddo, you want to be a super bug? Now uh, just stick some of these into your genome and penicillin won't be able to arm you. So this is what happens. This is how resistance spreads. So they spread easily uh, from one bacteria, from one bacteria to the other. So it's, it's a very terrible situation. And now the question I want to pose to us is, um, since this resistant bacteria is trying to do the work of uh, the work of spreading resistance to one fellow bacteria to the other. I want to ask what you want to do going forward. So will you also help to keep antibodies working? Will you help to join the fight against antibiotic resistance? Just as the bacteria is helping to spread resistance. So will you help to also uh, work in retaliation to what the bacteria are doing, trying to survive? So now this, and I pose a question to all of us. So in each of these pillars, we've talked about the awareness, IPC, surveillance, access to antibiotics, R&D. So looking at all of these pillars, so I want us to just take note, just you could just jot down some things you you feel uh, you can engage in going forward. Is it in the awareness pillar? Do you want to be more committed to uh, create awareness on the area of uh, antibiotic resistance? Do you want to be involved in more of IPC? Some of these activities are cross-cutting. So IPC you can be involved in IPC activities and also be involved in uh, awareness and also be involved in surveillance. But you could just pick one of these pillars and say, okay, I know I can fit in all of these, but I want to see start this activity and see it to the end and ensure I am uh, making uh, progress in this area. So are you interested in AMS and still research as the case may be? So you're so, uh, so please let's take us some few minutes to just uh, write out some of these areas based on the pillars. What uh, do you think uh, you're going to commit an action to going forward? So it's a call for everyone, everyone, all farmers, it's a call to action for us to to make commitments in our respective places, in our community of pharmacy practice. And um, I noticed one time, also Real mentioned, made mention of the fact that there's some group of um, healthcare professionals came to meet him, requesting for some over the, some um, 
requesting him to dispense um, antibody uh, some medication that was supposed to be a prescription. They were no antibodies anyways, and um, so he was able to decline the offer because they didn't get prescription from uh, the doctor. So we could also start doing that with the antibiotics, and it's something that's been implemented in India. So in India, they they did that with the Chennai Declaration. There's something they call the Chennai Declaration. You can read that. Just like the way we have the poison, uh, the, the the poison drugs and the poison book, the from K, uh, that um, used to some of those narcotics and stuff like that have to be dispensed following prescription. So in India, they started that implementation where they categorize some groups of antibiotics. So we could even start with that in our in our settings, like some of, some certain groups in the wash category and in the reserve category should just be placed on formulary restriction or restriction. So these are some of the things we could also start doing even in our local settings and. In our facility that is to be. Okay, so the take-home message, organizational leadership and individual leadership is very key. Systems thinking, so you pick from the five pillars like I mentioned initially. So think outside the box is very, very important. So collect and use data. So your data informs your actions. So you cannot go and tell them, oh, we're having a lot of misuse of antibiotics in this facility, or there's a lot of prescription of penicillin, or a lot of prescription of wash or reserve group of antibiotics. So you need the data to back up your fact. That's why in our own little way, we just have to start collecting data and also research further on the area to see how we could um, turn the fat fight on antimicrobial resistance. So I want to leave us with this message. And um, so before we're going to round up, I also want us to take the pledge. And so please don't leave. I also have a pledge I want us to take at the end too. So why is the threat of antimicrobial resistance is imminent and it's hard on every aspect of healthcare, undermining progress made so far? Now it is pertinent and of utmost priority that healthcare professionals in Nigeria put their differences aside, sit on the table and work as a team to devise innovative means to combat this threat to our collective existence. Now it must be known or made clear that there's no one discipline in this fight, but a multidisciplinary and multifaceted approach. So the AMR is a one health approach. So it's not just the pharmacy team alone, but pharmacists, wow, um, uh, I want us to take a charge, take a lead in this area to see how we can mobilize others and um, let uh, and lead this fight against antibiotic resistance. So there's nothing about controlling antimicrobial resistance without a multidisciplinary one head approach. So it's a, it's a teamwork, so not just pharmacists alone. So pharmacists working, you also getting involved with other healthcare professionals as well to, to spread the, the gospel of rationalism of antibiotics. So thank you very much. My acknowledgement, the NCDC, uh, Dr. Chupe, the team. So all of these contributed to when we're developing a national national antimicrobial resistance. So all the technical working group members, the academic stakeholders that worked there this week, to ensure Nigeria came up with a national action plan. And then presently activities are still ongoing. A lot of activities that we can't even finish in one day happening as we speak in the countries in terms of implementing uh, antibiotic resistance action plan. Okay, so these are some of my references. And um, so there are also online resources available. So if you want to go further to know more about point prevalence survey, go further about antimicrobial stewardship, so there's a lot of resources in this space for, for you to also improve your knowledge on them. And then there are also opportunities too, like the Royal Society to Tropical Medicine Hygiene Small Grant Program. So if some of us that are interested in research, so that's, that program, that call is out. So, so the call is out as, as we speak, so you can apply. You could go to the Royal Society for Tropical Medicine and Hygiene website to apply for that. And also the ISID, International Society for Infectious Disease, they usually have a small grant program. And then there are other opportunities too in this space, but I just can't list all of them. Okay, so there are other opportunities for us to uh, to engage in as, as, as stewards of antibiotic uh, use. So at this junction, I want to stop and entertain discussions, bring in your comments, questions, and let's discuss. So thank you very much. Thank you very much, Famlo, for the wonderful presentation. It was really eye-opening. So without wasting much time, please would entertain any questions. If you have a question, please kindly type your question in the question and answer box. So you can bring your comments, you can contribute comments. <laughs> For money, please have a question. Okay. an answer box. How can we integrate? Okay, by Sunday, right? Yes, yes. How can we integrate PMVs in this effort to mitigate the effects on migration since they have access to the largest populace? Yeah, that is true. They have access. And, um, you know, of recent, they are part of the stakeholders. 
uh, because we, I think when we're developing the national action plan, uh, a representative of the PPMV was involved. And then the NCDC, I think sometime last year, if I can remember vividly, sometime last year, they engaged them sort of in activities and enlightenment in that section. And then there's something the PCN, the PCN is trying to work on, uh, sort of an a urban spoke model, whereby uh, some PPMVs are under, uh, are under a particular pharmacy, and then the pharmacy oversees the activities of that PPMV. So it's, it has happened in, um, I think, Tanzania. So usually uh, there's this other, this particular course where I do work on looking at innovations happening around the world. So in Tanzania, uh, the PPMVs have been empowered, most of the PPMVs have been empowered to uh, to dispense antibiotics rationally because there are some areas, even in the, in the there are some settings where you can't even see pharmacies there. So instead of telling PPMVs not to dispense as well, so they train them and then they give them categories, just like, okay, in the access group, there are some certain antibiotics in the access group that you are supposed to dispense and the case may be. So the current efforts are ongoing at the moment to speak to integrate PPMVs. Yeah, thank you. Okay, thank you very much for that. I believe some of us should still have one or two questions before we round up. Yeah, I saw someone asked, what please, was the hashtag for creating awareness on Twitter? Uh, so you can just use hashtag AMR, hashtag antibiotic resistance, hashtag um, uh, AMR action Nigeria. So these are common AMR hashtags that are there. Then one thing I would advise the YPG, if you want to come up with your own campaign, you could now, like what Nigeria did during the World Antibiotics Awareness Week, Nigeria actually, um, Nigeria, custom, Nigeria developed our own hashtag, sort of the, they brought a the custom hashtag, which is, uh, they did hashtag AMR action and NG. So this is done in such a way that whereby, where uh, tweets are being collected from activities done globally that period, you notice that, oh, this hashtag is unique to this particular country and this was done during this period of time. So Nigeria actually top um, hashtag that we're trending in April. So with YPG, you could come up with uh, a YPG, AMR YPG action on Nigeria, whatever the case may be. You understand? So that hashtag will be unique to you and all your awareness activities on AMR uh, will actually be on that hashtag. So if anyone wants to vet what you've been doing over the years, you could just go to Twitter, check on that hashtag and say, oh, the YPGs have been, they started this thing and they've been doing it in this so, so number of years. Maybe that makes sense. Okay, great. Any other question? Okay, we have another one on the question and answer chat box. Okay, someone said, thanks for the lecture. Please, can you make available some of the links to the grants and call for research related to the email? Okay. Yes, we will we, try to make that available. We'll try to make that available. Uh, Okay, yes, I'll share the slides. The slides will be shared. The slides will be shared, the links. And if you want to join, if you want to join ongoing activities, um, you could also reach out to us. You could also reach out to us via email. And like, like I mentioned, what the YPG is doing is also part of Activist Globally. So you just, you can, it's part of the Activist Globally. So you just have to align what the national body is doing. So in your own little way, you could contribute via the YPG also join organizations that are spearheading EMR activities like Disability Solutions. You can join, you could write to them and see how you could volunteer in activities in that space because Disability Solutions normally do a lot of activities in the space. And recently we concluded a multi, uh, uh, a multi, a, a sub-Saharan Africa uh, antimicrobial stewardship, antimicrobial internship for young for undergraduate pharmacists. So we have we, we did that from the countries we put across five African countries. So from the internship program. So yeah, you could write to this place you want to volunteer in some of the activities we are doing and then through YPG you could also volunteer and be part of creating awareness on your own little way. We have another comment in the chat box. Okay, let me see. So most times patients are brought to the hospital as emergency and there's need for urgent management advice. What do you advise? Yeah, so this has always been most of the scenarios. Like I mentioned initially, patients just come and they just place them on breast spectrum antibiotics. And maybe they just leave it, breast spectrum antibiotics, they just leave it open. And um, it's just because the hospital does not have uh, 
uh, hospital treatment guidelines. Usually most times, most of these treatment guidelines are being informed by what the laboratory investigates. So for instance, uh, in the treatment guidelines, you state what should be given, what antibiotics should be given in emergency cases of such. So you notice patients, because of lack of antibody utilization of antibody treatment guidelines, you find that people do whatever is autonomous. So they just give the trials and they give that and they give that in emergency cases of emergency cases. So usually there should be a uh, particular antibody that should be given in such cases. And when patients don't respond to that, they could probably go something higher. Yeah. So but um, it is what it is in our settings because uh, this treatment guidelines are not being implemented, and even the local, uh, there's no local stewardship committees that monitors all of this. In the in the other in in in, in the overseas, and these are things that are being implemented daily. So, anyways, Nigeria is starting off on a good note, and we'll definitely get there. All right, thank you, um, pharmacist. Love Monie, our senior colleague. When the suggestion that we go for pharmacist love came up, uh, I did not have any doubts that he would do a wonderful job. And here we are, we have learned a whole lot. I believe seeing us now, we would have been doing the round of applause for you on behalf of people White in this seminar, saying thank you very much, sir. Um, okay. Sorry, sir, before we before we continue, are you there? Yes, we are here, sir. Okay, yeah. So somebody was asking a question. Was somebody asked a question? Let me just quickly attend to, and then, uh, person mentioned, what's your advice to ask wife? Okay, say just you want to answer. No, 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 no. So I was highlighting it for you. No. Okay. Okay. So what was the advice to ask wife or homekeepers who just buy me some random sellers? <laughs> So we are just at the mercy of God. Though. We are just at the mercy of God because most times you go to this abattoir, you don't even you don't even know uh, some of their, their practices. You notice unhygienic practices in the place where they kill these animals and all of that. So there are some group of um, uh, I think micro veterinarians that are actually didn't work in that space, trying to uh, let uh, inform the public on some of these um, signs that they, they can see in meat. That okay, no, if you know this. These are some of the signs we get seeing meat. You know, this meat is infected and bad and stuff like that. But the least we can just do when we buy some of these um, abattoirs and the rest, we buy them the way you can and do your normal washing. At least we reduce the one that can go away. The ones that cannot go, we just survive at the mercy of God. <laughs> yeah. So, guys, there's this, uh, there's the antibiotic guardian pledge. So, please, um, unfortunately, we are not uh, in, in person physically. So, usually, what we do normally, we uh encourage everyone to take the pledge, take the anti antibiotic pledge. And so we tend to echo it. So usually I read and you, you follow me, insert your name and all of that. But um, I don't know how that can be done now because we're doing it um, and online. So babe, what I'll just advise, I'll just advise us to go to, there's the anti-biotic guardian page. So you just go there and then try to sign up, take your pledge there. And um, so they're going to give you a certificate when you do that. So you can, you can actually sample your certificate on Twitter, courtesy of the YPG AMR webinar class. So please, I think this is one of the lowest hanging fruit you can do. You can as well tag me on Twitter as the case may be. So this is one of the lowest hanging fruit. So just go to antibioticguardian.com and you see the different pledge for healthcare professionals. Then you see the pharmacist particular, you try to take your pledge there. Then you'll be given a certificate and then you're officially inducted and you start your, your activities. Okay, so thank you very much, guys. Okay, so sir, over to you. You can actually connect on Twitter, on LinkedIn. And we can also continue the conversations further. Okay, thank you, guys. So sir, over to you. There is one more question for you, just a quick one. Though it sounds very funny, but that's the reality on ground. Um, in a bid to cope the misuse of antibiotics, what do we do about people selling antibiotics in public transport? Do you have any comments on that, sir? So that's where the PCN, uh, the PCN has a major role to play there. But you know one thing, when we're developing this uh, national action plan, the PCN guys are saying they're understaffed. And they're understaffed and they are not being supported in terms of um, 
enough manpower and then security personnel because when you want to go and enforce this thing, you need for security personnel, I don't for security personnel to go along. It's just because these things are not being um, uh, the, the PCN that is being mandated to carry these uh, regulations and control of irrational of, of improper about uh, as, if, of improper states of antibiotics as is being really, really understaffed and them. Uh, so it, normally these issues is something that is supposed to be, people like these are supposed to be arrested. So they're supposed to be sort of uh, a law in that regards. So when the PCN they're trying, the, the, it's, 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 it's a big tax on them. You, if you can notice they've been, they've been saying they want to try to see how to reduce um, the open drug market and trying to close it down and stuff like that. For how many years now, it's been, it's been an ongoing war. So it's, it's, it's a continuous battle and it's something um, we hope to see that it comes to an end one day. So there's nothing on our part we can do, but uh, just leave it up to the regulatory agencies to see what uh, they can, what solution they can come up in that regard. Yeah. Okay. Thank, Thank you very you. much. I think there's a, one more question. Please be our last question before we round up the question and answer box. Is there a way whereby non health workers are restricted from getting some vital information on drugs online? Because most of these AMR arise from people doing self medication business. <laughs> There's no way for us for that to be controlled. You know, it's Google now. If you just Google anything, you just go. So I don't know if there's any way to restrict that because uh, uh, Google is Google has made information to be in your room. So you can just. So it's 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 impossible to do that unless. So that's where the role of health promotion comes into play. Exactly. So you know some famous influencers on Twitter, like a good doctor and some other that doing a lot of work in the space. So that's where a lot of health promotion. There's a lot of health illiteracy in Nigeria. So a lot of this health promotion advice should be aired on radios and jingles and papers and stuff like that, advising patients not to self-medicate, not to even Google their symptoms. But once they come down with infections or whatever, they just go to the nearest pharmacy. So we need a lot of health promotion activities in that regard. So that's the only way that's going to reduce that. Yeah. Thank you. Someone said in the chat box as a way of comment about buying meat in the market. I did a research for my MSC in Univac where we collect samples of meat from abattoirs in Lagos and analyzed to see if there would be traces of antibiotics growth promoters. Some of the antibiotics were far surpassed the acceptable limits. So it's important to keep talking about this at all level. Thank you, Benga. No, that is really correct. That is really true. Like, see, there's this lady that works with us. Um, she's from the Ministry of Fisheries Department. She she needs to tell you that. So Nigeria normally, the Nigerian normally export fish and other products outside the country. But the EU and the US they refuse taking, taking in our products because a lot of residues that was found in this exceeded the, the acceptable limits even in the fish products like even in the beans the beans the beans the, the beans we consume and so it's it's we it's crazy what's happening in the country now a lot of residues even chemical content because usually there's supposed to be an acceptable level that um can be that should be allowed to be in the whatever in the food product and something like that but in nigeria it's very crazy you see all of this beyond the acceptable level and um and we now ingest and consume these things it causes further problems so it's a big war. It's a big war. That's why no one person can do the fight of AMR alone. So that's why what the YPG is doing is very, very, is very, very timely and welcoming. And then I want to encourage you guys to keep it up and continue the good work. So thank you very much. So we we so much appreciate your um, being here with us and we thank participants for making our time to attend this. Um, our first web series on antimicrobial resistance. We are going to be having this project running throughout the year, every third week of the month. And you will be duly informed on the prerequisites, what you need to do to be attending these events. And we are looking at capping it for on the day of World Antibiotic the, the Global Day for Antibiotics. So I hope you'll be with us throughout this period to get informed and to also help the general public in enlightening them in your own little way on the risks involved 
in his using and abusing antibiotics. Thank you very, very much. I don't know if there is any announcement by the secretary of the Young Pharmacists Group to make, and if there is none, we can call it a day. Okay, thank you very much, Farm for moderating this meeting. Um, special appreciation to Farm Love for many from the wonderful presentation. It was really eye opening and we learned a lot, and we appreciate you for coming to speak to us. And I also want to thank everyone, all young pharmacists who took out time today to attend this, and we appreciate you all.